I would like to take you on a, a journey, a journey into the future, a journey that I will describe through the idiom of a transition towards a green economy. It's, in my mind, a journey that is both planetary and I think also intensely personal. All of us, all of you, everybody on this planet is part of that journey. It's a journey that for me personally began a long time ago. I was born to a farming family in Brazil and found myself over the years increasingly drawn towards becoming a development economist. After completing my studies, the first and perhaps most stark experience occurred when I arrived in Pakistan in the northwest frontier province, the home of the Patans, and I began with all the enthusiasm to think about development in all its aspirations and also ambitions. But it just took a few months to realize then already that often what we practice or promote in the name of development is both incomplete and also, sadly, often ends up impoverishing the very people in whose name development technologies, policies and programs are implemented. In Pakistan, it was the experience of seeing villagers losing their natural resource base. The very foundations of their livelihoods were in the process of development, but also in the process of societal change actually being destroyed. The idea that we could escape from nature in order to achieve another state of development very quickly lost its attraction and promise. And it, is, was, it was at that point in time that for me the notion of people and the planet, of ecology and economy, suddenly became an increasingly central focus to my own journey. A journey that in a sense is trying to unlearn what I learned at university that there is an economic paradigm, I would even call it an economic dogma, that there's a kind of economic philosophy to which there are no alternatives, almost like the laws of gravity. There's a journey that then took me into the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, because interestingly enough, around the late 80s, early 90s, it was in the conservation world that some of the most interesting rethinking about development was happening, about the relationship between people and nature, about ecology and economy, and also about how development and people would feature as the central part of this story. From there on, I moved to something called the World Commission on Dams, perhaps the most hot and contested territory in the development discourse, certainly in certain parts of the world. Large dams evoke illusions, perhaps, of grandeur, but certainly passions of human ingenuity, transforming entire river basins into something that produces energy, provides water, allows agriculture and irrigation to happen, was for 100 years the vision, the dream associated with the construction of large dams. In fact, if you want to discover the journey of development over the last 100 years, then large dams are a perfect symbol for that. I spent three years as the Secretary General of the World Commission on Dams trying to facilitate a dialogue about what actually is a good dam and what is a bad dam. And it is not just about the ingenuity of technology and engineering and design. It is not just about the electricity produced. The storyline of large dams is also one of great human tragedy. Millions of people resettled, worse off than they were before, deprived of their land rights, and often not even supplied with the benefits associated with the construction of large dams. And perhaps least visible but most dramatic, the environmental, the ecological cost. Because Water, in the minds of many of the engineers, was wasted if it were to reach the sea and not be used. But in fact, we have learned through science and through understanding our planet better and better that in fact, the ecology of a river basin is so much more than just the water flowing through it. And it is also so much more than just the ecology. It is in fact the economy, the livelihoods of people who have lived along those river basins, sometimes for millennia. From there, I returned, if you want, to IUCN because I was convinced that it is in the relationship between nature and people and economy that the future of development would be defined. It was the beginnings of the articulation of this notion that a transition towards a green economy was not only a necessity, it had become an imperative. And indeed, when I was appointed as Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program in 2006, it was in many ways a milestone in my own journey. Because the discourse about the future of development, about environmental sustainability, about social equity and about economic progress, in many ways is most alive in the debates but also the disputes that we find in the United Nations. 
But let me emphasize, when I speak today to you about the transition towards a green economy, this is not some form of alternative universe. It's also not an ideology, quite frankly. It is an imperative, an imperative to accept that we live in an age where transformation is both a necessity and an obligation. And that is why I believe we all are part of this journey. When I arrived here in Nairobi, one of the first things that happened to me was meeting Wangari Matai. It was the time when the Climate Convention had its meeting here in Nairobi. And Wangari came up to me just a couple of days before the Conference of the Parties and said, Achim, it's enough talking. We must do something. And we must do something to make people feel that they can make a difference. And bold as Wangari Matai was, she said, we should call for a target of getting people to plant a billion trees. Trees are an immensely powerful symbol, both of what we talk about when we talk about our planet, about ecosystems, about nature, but also immensely powerful because every one of us can plant a tree somewhere. And in her ingenuity and also in her wisdom, she declared this target of let us get the world to plant one billion trees. No one would be paid for it. All we would do would be create a space where people could come together and actually register that they had done something. I was a little bit nervous. New executive director, the United Nations Environment Program calling for something that really seemed quite an elusive target. I thought it would take four to five years to get there. Lo and behold, it took less than eight months to have a billion trees planted and registered. So we doubled the target. We doubled it again, and we doubled it again until four years later, people had planted 14 billion trees. 14 billion trees. Individual actions across the planet. It is these kinds of encounters that were so central also to my own journey, because the power of an individual like Wangari Matai, who began one tree at a time, one woman at a time, to work towards changing the way we look at trees, at forests, in our lives, in our societies, in our economies, is to me still an immensely powerful symbol. In fact, it was so powerful that she became the first, not only woman, the first person in the history of the Nobel Peace Prize to be awarded that prize for the way that she brought the topic of peace and nature and humanity together. But also it was the time where climate change became the central preoccupation of the international community. And here I was, executive director of the United Nations Environment Program, having to somehow find answers to the questions that people were asking. How on earth are we going to address something like climate change? We are powerless. These things are happening in the global atmosphere. I'm not the person building a coal-fired power station. What can we do? And here really is a moment where I want to take you back a simple image, which is planet Earth. The extraordinary thing is that the reason why we are, in fact, at the point in time where transformation is our obligation and responsibility is that the last 250 years of what has happened on this planet, or what we, in a sense, have contributed to the future of this planet, has changed everything. It really has changed everything. We are today 7 billion people. In just 300 years, we went from 1 billion to 7 billion. We are today in a situation where we are able to fundamentally transform the life support systems on this planet. Who would have thought 300 years ago that we would be talking about changes in the atmosphere, a hole in the ozone layer, the collapse of the world's fisheries in more and more of the world's marine fisheries resources. Who would think that we would be able to destroy over 50% of the world's wetlands in just 100 years? All in the name of progress, in the name of development. It is a phenomenon that is almost unimaginable, and I'm always intrigued by this notion of living in the age of the Anthropocene. We are, in many ways, the first generation that has to accept the fact that we are a species or a part of this planetary um, amalgamation where we are really able to change everything. And the responsibility to accept that fact and secondly to accept also the opportunity that we have to change things has to be central. But how do we do this? You have listened to many good examples today and I simply align myself with the speakers that have spoken to you about the many different entry points and experiences that happen. I, for one, began to rediscover my economics profession, having, in a sense, left it for a long time and focused more on ecology and nature, because I suddenly realized that not perhaps so different from where Bill Clinton once was when he ran his election campaign, that actually, friends, it's the economy, stupid. It's not that we need to reduce everything that happens on this planet 
to economics and finance and prices. But let me just tell you, if you do not accept a reality that I believe is determining everything we do today, then you will not succeed in changing the framework within which we operate. We live in economically determined times. The fact that the world measures its own progress in one of the crudest forms of measuring progress, namely gross domestic product, which every economist will acknowledge is at best a half-baked indicator of progress, that whole governments are today finding themselves in a situation where certain financial institutions are too big to let them fail, so that we in debt two or three generations just to bail somebody out who, in a sense, made a mistake. We are living also in a time where if we continue to look at nature and the planet as essentially something that is almost like cornucopia, it is free, it has no economic value, then essentially the logic of economic development and of economic policy is to say that something that is free and has no economic value is essentially not something that we will factor into the future of our economies. That, unfortunately, is the tragedy of much of what nature provides us today. It is simply in the way that our economies function, that government policies are set, that businesses look at their risks, viewed as something without value. Imagine for a moment bees and pollination services. For millennia, we have accepted that much of what grows on our planet depends on pollination by insects and bees. Yet, at this very moment, there are people in parts of the world who have to carry pollen by hand and with brushes apply them to plants because there are no more insects and certainly no more bees who are providing those services. For a long time, bees are something that we consider to be a harassment in our daily lives. Little did we realize that pollination and the services that bees and insects provide to us is worth billions of dollars. In fact, in the United States of America and California, there are people who now drive around with beehives to farms and offer their bees as a service. In a sense, trying to understand the value of nature to our societies, to our future, is not something of a reductionism. It is, in fact, accepting that unless we can also articulate in a world that is dominated by economic decision-making, the value of nature, we will not succeed in correcting the terrible misallocations of capital, the distortions in our economies that have driven us to the point where we have a planet where the atmosphere is in trouble, the biosphere is in trouble, air, land, water resources are increasingly scarce. The answers that traditional economists provide to us is, well, technology will solve it, economics and markets will answer this, science will allow us to escape this. Reflect for a moment what an interesting time we live in. At the beginning of the 21st century, more knowledge, more data, more technology, more science than ever before, and here we are confronted as humanity and as a planet with phenomena that threaten the very future survival of people across the planet, and in a sense, the planet as we know it. And the answers are not only in trying to escape from that logic of nature is something that we have to overcome. It is actually bringing us back to discovering how vital nature is to the future of development of our economies and to the future of this planet. It is against this backdrop that our work on the green economy is trying to open the eyes of many people to a number of stark realities. One, the paradigm of the last 200 years, Industrial Revolution and after that, has essentially been premised on the fact that you first exploit the planet, almost like a mining operation, in order to develop, and then you'll somehow fix it. Well, the bad news is we're beyond being able to fix it, because much of that thesis was that you actually moved on to somewhere else and took somebody else's resources in order to sustain your development. Today, we are 7 billion people. We are on a planet under stress. We are facing energy security issues, food security issues. Sometimes a drought in one part of the world will overnight price literally millions of people out of their basic food commodities because of the way that our global economy works. This is not to say that everything is economic, but unless we accept that we must also address ourselves to an economic paradigm, or what I would often refer to as a dogma, that we need to evolve, we need to change, we will be imprisoned by it. And that, I think, is the tragedy of the 21st century at the moment, and certainly of the latter part of the 20th century. Our ability to rethink the way our economies work, and as we say in UNIP also, by working towards a transition towards an inclusive green economy, 
we begin to redefine the relationship between ecology and the economy through people, through people's choices, through people's decisions, and through the actions that we either enable or prevent from happening. I mentioned the climate change challenge of our time. It was certainly one that I, with my colleagues in UNEP, decided that through the storyline of the renewable energy pathway, we could offer people something that would demonstrate that there is not only opportunity, there's every reason to believe that we can do something about the future. But you know, for the last 25 to 30 years, we've been told by all the pundits, economists, energy specialists, macroeconomic planners, ministers of finance, renewable energy, not really available. Renewable energy, we don't really need it. Okay, it's possible, but it's too expensive. Okay, it's actually not that expensive anymore, but quite frankly, you can't keep our economies lit up with renewable energy. I mean, a few windmills, uh, wind turbines and photovoltaic panels, how are you going to power an economy? Friends, please study the story of renewable energy over the last 10 years. It is the perfect illustration of what happens when people choose a different pathway. It is when governments, as a result of people saying you cannot simply go on with what you're doing right now, decided to change the macroeconomic policy framework, the energy policies. What became, in a sense, a there is no opportunity and no option here, suddenly became a public choice. And lo and behold, today 140 countries in the world have renewable energy targets. Countries such as Germany are producing from virtually nothing 10 years ago to today a quarter of their entire electricity with renewable energy. The total investments last year in renewable energy worldwide were higher in terms of new infrastructure and investments than the total combined for oil, gas and coal. Go back to the reports of the pundits 10 years ago and read what they told you would happen. There's a big lesson here. The past and trends of the past are never an indication of what the future will be like. And it is also through people like Angela Merkel, just to put her alongside somebody like Wangari Matai, two women leaders, two people who came from a very humble background, in a sense became through serendipity, through their careers and through the positions that they came to occupy, to be women who have transformed nations, entire discourses around our planet. And it was in Germany, Angela Merkel, who took the decision after Fukushima that it was time to finally make a choice to go down a different path. What I'm trying to convey to you is that having that opportunity to choose is something that begins with each one of us. We can look to leaders, and each one of us may find themselves in different positions and opportunities. When I arrived in Nairobi and I was appointed as executive director, in many ways, I thought, what on earth am I going to do to change the world? I now have one of the most influential platforms, perhaps, in our community to speak to the world about this. Well, part of it has been to try and liberate ourselves from the imprisonment that economic paradigms and dogmas have imposed on us for generations now. Each one of you, each one of us, can begin to change that by questioning those who say that this is the only way we can proceed. You know, we know, everybody knows that the future 100 years from now will be a terrible one if we simply build it on the way that we have developed as peoples and as economies and as societies over the last 100 to 200 years. It is in this confidence that change is possible that I would like to also invite you to study this notion of a transition towards a green economy. It is transformational. It touches on many different sectors and in the Green Economy Report of UNEP, you will find the pathways, the data, the evidence of people who have already done it. This is the extraordinary thing. It is actually happening today. But we live in a world that is essentially by virtue of global economic policy and politics fixated with the notion that we can only succeed if we compete against each other. This is the wrong paradigm. It is also by, to me, the spirit of multilateralism of the United Nations is such a valuable good in this very challenging time because it is the counter proposition that the future is one where we are all working against each other and in the transition towards a green economy we can change the way the world works this is the planet as it was viewed a few decades ago and an image that transformed our perception of the fragility of our planet and of our responsibility to act the power of one, whether of Wangari Matai 
or a villager or somebody who in the Chipko movement in India or the people like Chico Mendes were not people who had power but they had conviction and with their conviction they gained the power to change entire societies, entire development stories and I believe that we have to learn that everything counts. The initiative from the bottom up but also recognizing that unless we change the frameworks which at the moment so badly guide us in the wrong direction are changed, we are not going to succeed. And I invite you on this journey into a green economy as not something that is trying to impose on you either an ideology or suggest to you that there is a nirvana just across the next mountain. No, it is actually a way of liberating our thinking and certainly challenging those who are saying that the way we are managing the world right now is the only way to do it. It is not. And each one of us, every day, across the world, can actually change this. I hope that is part of a journey, both intensely personal, but also planetary, that for many of you is one that you share and that you will continue to be part of. Thank you very much.